This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to our show, which is Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and today we have our guest is Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral research associate within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. And welcome, David. Thank and you. And I believe you're going to be telling us a little bit about some of your recent lunar research studies. Is oh, that yes. Correct? Yes. So you've been doing a variety of other topics. You mentioned to me offline that you're studying carbon on Mercury, but today it's the moon. Yep. All right. So for our viewers, why don't we start with a little bit of a background information on the moon. We've got a picture of the moon, which okay. we can show as a first slide. And just walk us through. Here we see a telescopic view of the moon. Right. So this is the, uh, the near side of the moon. Um, as everyone has seen before, it's, it's a nice, beautiful body that we have near our, um, our home Earth. Uh, you can see that there's two major areas. There's the dark areas, which is known as the maria. Um, it's mostly made of basaltic material, which or basaltic rock, like what we see in Hawaii. Um, and then you have the highlands area, uh, which is the lighter, white, so a uh, grayish area. So down um, at the bottom, for example, yep. is that that's the the highlands. Yeah, and and that's mostly made of um, anorthosite or the rock anorthosite, um, and. As you can see, and, and then I think the third thing I would like to point out is you can see these beautiful craters, these circular uh, morphological objects um, throughout, and then they have these nice, beautiful rays that radiate from the center. That's the very bright filamentary material right. which is stretching across. Which we'll really talk about a little bit today. Right, so. right. And, and just for a bit more background, um, we've obviously been to the moon before. How many moon landings? Where did they go? That sort of thing. Well, so, I mean, we had Apollo 11 to Apollo 17. Unfortunately, 13 didn't make it. Um, uh, and they all landed in the near side in different areas to just sample, you know, different, different regions that are a little bit different from each other so we can get a more broader understanding of the moon. Right, and yeah. that time period was like between 69 and 72. Right, yep. Yeah, before, unfortunately, before I was born. <laughs> ah, I was just at uh, high school and college. So, for example, for my own uh, undergraduate thesis, I was looking at the Apollo landing. Oh, but that must be so. I, I, wish I, I wish it happens in my lifetime you, to see this. You are the, the focus of today's show. So, sounds as if we didn't learn everything we could through the Apollo missions, for example. Mm -hmm. You've been working with uh, various people at Manoa. Uh, to do additional lunar research. What kinds of things uh, have you been doing? Um, most of the things that I've been really focused on is to kind of look at the moon and look at the different landscapes on the moon, or what we say in geology, you know, the geomorphology of, of the moon. But, we're, you know, I want to know, like, why is that mountain here? Why is this crater over here? Um, can we use these craters to understand these different, like, the age of the surface? Um, and also like volcanics as well, and how do they differ from Earth? Um, so it's, it's, that's what I've been really focused on, is a lot of like understanding impact craters, uh, volcanics, um, the various volcanoes on the moon, um, and a little bit of just kind of like surface processes called space weathering. So those are kind of like the main three I've been really Okay, doing. and are you using data from the Apollo missions? Because there's other spacecraft still in orbit around right. the moon, for example. Um, the majority of the data that I'm using is um, is called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was launched in 2009. Um, and also using another uh, spacecraft that I frequently, uh, the Kaguya spacecraft, which is from a Japanese mission. Um, and both missions provided brand new, great data sets, um, which, you know, over 20, 30 years, technology have gotten better. So, you know, we can now focus on using these new data sets instead of relying on the old Apollos. All right. Although presumably the Apollo landing sites where they brought samples back to Earth, a good calibration point. Oh, definitely. I mean, without them, we wouldn't be able to to produce the amount of science that we are that we can now, and have the inter same interpretations. Um, without them, you would. You know, it'd be a little bit more lost in the dark. Okay, well, speaking of like 
this high level research which you're doing. We've just seen a picture from a telescope of the moon. Let's go to the second slide because I think the second slide shows one of your analyses and David, you're gonna to have to help the viewers here. What a nanophase iron. Oh, yes. What we're looking at is this the whole moon or just the near this side? This is the, um, almost the entire moon, uh, including the near side and the far side, so the, the side that we cannot see. Um, but we're limited from uh, 60 to negative 60 degrees latitude. That means we can't see the poles. Um, and part of that is just because of the data that we originally have. You know, there's not a good lighting up on the poles just because of its angle relative to the sun. You know, so the data that we're showing here is from 60 to negative 60 only. Um, and these are data collected either from this Japanese Kaguya satellite yep. or from the US? This one uh, in particular is from Kaguya. Um, so this, what we're seeing here is not a, a data product directly from Kaguya. Basically, Kaguya produced these uh, spectral data. And we apply um, these fancy radio transfer models to produce what we call data products. So the next level of taking the data and because this new. looks very different from the regular telescopic photographs. Oh, so yep, for sure. What, what do you think this is actually showing? So, yeah, so what we're seeing is this thing called nanophase iron. So what nanophase iron is all these really tiny iron particles. They're about less than like 100 uh, nanometers in diameter, so they're really small. And these particles are embedded on the surface of grains within these glass. So you have a grain, you know, you have a mineral, and then it's draped and covered by glass. And within that glass are these nanophase irons. And these are due to this thing called space weathering. Right. We've, so, we've had people on the show talking oh, about yeah. space weather, for so example. So without, without that atmosphere, um, the moon is bombarded by particles and high energy particles, micrometeorites, so small tiny rocks. So that particular image could be interpreted in terms of the, the age of the real topmost layer that we're seeing on the That's surface, actually something we're trying to figure out right now. Um, that nanophase iron map that I showed you is actually is work on the way, actually. Uh -huh. It's not published yet. It's, it's almost there. We um, heard it first here, folks. Yep. Yeah. And so, it's, so what we're seeing is um, how abundant these things are, but we don't know if we can use it to actually age uh, the surface yet. Um, part, especially that map in particular. And the reason is if you look at the Mare area, it's really bright in nanophase iron, but in the highlands there isn't so much. Um, part of that reasoning is probably because if you look at the Mare, if you look at how much iron is it in the actual um, rock, there's a lot of iron. The highlands, not so much. So it could be compositional as well as age. Correct, yeah. All right. and, yep. and you've brought along in the next slide, I think uh, we'll see just a little bit of the uh, sort of uh, a thin section or whatever it is. So um, again, explain to us what it is we're looking at and what the, the scale bar 10 nm, is that nanometers? Yep, so that's, this, is, this is a nice image, um, pretty much, you know, really close up image of a grain where you can see the AN stands for north, uh, northite, which is a type of mineral. Um, and on top of that, you can see that there's this glassy rim, which is a uh, rim in this, in this image. And then the iron metal is these nice, uh, nice round spheres that are embedded inside this glassy. And, and this is a thin section of a real. Uh, this is a TEM image. All right. Yeah. So uh, transition transmission electron microscope. Right. Of yeah. a real lunar rock. Yep. Okay. Yep. And this is the sort of thing which will be responsible for the various changes in grayscale mm -hmm. in the previous image. And I think our next image also will show us something a little bit different. Yep. This is microphase. Now, explain again, difference between right. nanophase and microphase. So microphase is um, pretty much the same idea, but the, the, the iron particles are much larger. So instead of being less than 100 nanometers, we're looking at iron particles that are greater than 100 nanometers. Um, so you can see that the distribution between uh, the nanophase and the microphase are different. Um, for example, the fresh craters, these craters with bright rays, they still stick out in both the nanophase and the microphase. Um, but the mare is a little different. And you can see in the microphase, like there's areas in the mare that are dark, and there's parts in the mare that are And where you bright. say the mare is, we're looking at this image, basically 
think about in the middle where it's zero degrees longitude and in the middle where it's zero degrees it is the equator the equator's running from left to right yep. through here so the mare what we see from earth is a zero zero or something right like yeah. right okay and then you can combine these right yeah if you, all right so yep. the next slide so you know when you add the nanophase and the microphase, this is, so the idea is what we call a submicroscopic um, iron particle. And the idea to add them together is because they're both due to space weathering. Um, so when you combine them, you can see like, what is the effect of space weathering? So this is where we could actually use this map, potentially to use to age surfaces. Uh -huh. so, in, so when they are individual, you probably can't age the surface, but when you combine the nanophase and microphase together, might be able to. So this hasn't been calibrated yet to any um, any actual dates, which could because we have those Apollo samples. You know, without them, we wouldn't be able to do any calibration. But with those Apollo samples, we may be able to calibrate this map to um, actual right. Apollo ages. And, and so uh, perhaps we can see differences both in composition and differences in age. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and I always ask people. Who cares? What, what, why is this potentially important? Why, why you're spending a lot of time producing mm -hmm. these images? What do you see as the importance? I think the biggest importance of this is, is, is we're providing a brand new tool to the planetary science community. Um, this, this tool has been used um, previously, a, a predecessor map, which have been used greatly by the community, where they can use it to age different places on the surface, they can understand these things called, like, for example, these lunar swirls, these beautiful swirly patterns on the surface. And it is, you know, it's still a little bit hotly debated and hotly formed. And by understanding space weathering, we may have figured that out. So it, it helps with, you know, very different, various processes. Um, that occur on the moon. Okay, and I, I, I'm a bit of a space cadet myself, <laughs> and, and I'm really excited that we're starting to hear about both um, space agencies as well as private companies going back to the moon. Is this your data? Is that the kind of thing they would be reliant on? Do you, do you see a connection between your right. studies and, and what might have a practical application? Um, possibly. Uh, I can't think of any uh, applications to them right now, uh, mostly on the science side, but on the technological side, uh, I think that's something, you know, the, the advantage is if we have them, they could probably use in the Cause, future. Because presumably they need to know where, where's the best place to land for right. you know, resources. Or... Right. So yeah, and there is some compositional dependence on these maps, but that's one of the things that we're trying to remove when we look at these maps is to get rid of the composition so that we can just see the degree of space weathering in general. Okay, All right, yeah, because I've, I've heard that you know, there's some iron deposits uh, on certain parts of the moon, or going to lunar poles, for example, for lunar ices. That sort of thing will presumably dictate where people want to try and land right. and if we send people back to the moon. And that is definitely actually a future project that we're going to be working on within you know, the next year or so that we want to, um, you know, with new calibrated data of the poles, as you saw from those maps, they're only limited to 60 degrees to negative 60. But with the new data that includes the poles with calibrated data, we may actually extend these maps to include those poles as well. So then we could also understand the space Excellent. weathering that occurs up okay. in the latitudes. Well, I know um, you brought along some specific examples, and we'll get to those in the second part of the show. We need to take a break right now, so let me just remind all our viewers, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today is Dr. David Trang, who's a postdoctoral research associate from HIGP at UH Manoa. And we'll be back in about a minute, so see you then. Bye. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for ThinkTech Hawaii's research in Manila.
Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DT. Captain of our team. It's a DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. And welcome back, as our promo just told you, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today is Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral research associate within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. And David, we looked at the global view of the moon in the first half. Um, let's now delve into a few of the other studies which you've been doing at a much more localized level. Mm -hmm. And I think you've been concentrating more on trying to understand the way landforms have developed, is that correct? Yep. And, and what kind of techniques do you use to, to do that? Actually, um, we use almost every practical instrument that comes out of these orbiters, uh -huh. uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Kaguya, we use a lot of the instruments. So anything that ranges the entire um, light spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. So we use radar data, we use uh, thermal infrared, uh, we also use, you know, near visible and near visible uh, near infrared as well to understand um, these 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 objects and we also use altimeter data which tells us topography okay. so by using all these data they each one will tell you something a little bit different you know and they give you hints to how these things form or whatever property you're trying to look for and you take all this data you put it together and make these observations and then you try to find a model that just fits right into these Sounds quite challenging. Let's take a look at what one of the examples which you uh, have brought along. And here we're seeing this is the same geographic area on the moon. Is that correct? Yep, this is in the Murray. So the, the, the two images, one on the left, the grayscale, is that a regular satellite photograph? Yep, this is, a, this is a, what we call a 750 albedo map. So this is pretty much, this is really close to what you see with your naked eye. Um, 750, 750 nanometers, nanometers right. red light almost. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the outline that you're seeing is actually outlining the pyroclastic deposit itself. So pyroclastic, so a volcanic explosive deposit is what, okay. you're, what we're seeing here. And that's what we're seeing as the, the volcanic crater. And the right. colors on the right-hand side, we've got an image which appears to be elevations. Yep, this is what we call a topographic map. Um, so what you're seeing is red is... A, much higher and and purple and white is a very low elevation. Okay. So what's really cool about this is when you look at this at the 750 nanometers. So if you were in a spacecraft and saw this uh, this feature here, this vo this volcanic uh, feature, you'd probably just think it's just flat. It's you know it just has this nice beautiful crater in the middle. Um, but when you actually look at the numbers and get look at the topo uh, topographic map and really stretch these numbers out, you can start to see that these things are actually more of a dome, kind of like the volcanoes we see here in Hawaii. That's right. But and I understand you worked at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory for a while, so you would be a great person oh, yeah. to actually do a comparison between volcanic landforms, which one sees on the moon, with what we have here in Hawaii. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's and great. it was great to finally, you know, bring my knowledge from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and bring Would it up. Would that you know. feature we saw in the slide be similar perhaps to the Pu'uo uh, cone on Hawaii, or would it be a much bigger landform? Um, these things erupted a little bit differently from what we're seeing at Pu'uo, since Pu'uo is mostly Hawaiian-type uh, eruptions, so okay. continuous fountain of, of lava flying out of these uh, volcanoes, where what we're seeing here is what we call localized pyroclastic deposits on the moon. Um, and the reason why we call them localized is because there's two types. There's localized, which is small, and then the regionals, which are very big, cover big areas of the moon. Um, and it's, it's currently modeled right now. The current hypothesis is that these things have formed due to these things called volcanian eruption, or a pulse mm -hmm. of uh, lava being spewed out and thrown on around the 
the center of eruption. Okay, let's take a look at another slide because I, I think we've got a variety of different data sets which you've been working with. And, and this one, in the first half you were talking about glass. Mm -hmm. Here we're seeing another image which looks like a, a volcanic crater on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. um, tell us more about what we're seeing on the right. So we're, we're seeing kind of the similar thing to the last one, but instead of looking at topography, we're actually looking at how much glass is on this deposit. So what we've learned about these volcanic deposits on the moon is that they can range from uh, really crystalline, so a lot of minerals versus something that's just completely glass. Uh, so what we're seeing in this deposit is um, so from 0 to 100, so white is being low glass abundance, and 100 red is a lot of glass. That means most of the stuff is made out of glass. And that's important because it tells us something about the eruption itself. So when it erupts, it creates these nice plume, this little cloud, right? So within, as the, mag, as the lava is flying out, we can tell if it cooled quickly or it cooled slowly. So if it cooled fast, you make, you make glass. And if it cooled slowly, you make crystalline beads. So by knowing if you made glass versus crystalline, now we can predict at how thick was, what's the density of material was spewed out at once from these uh, volcanic And, and some of our viewers may have seen postcards of the fire fountain events from Pu'uo. Right. Presumably this is the same kind of thing. And can you then, if the glass content tells you something about how quickly the lava cooled, mm -hmm. that tells you what? Is it the composition, or is it the height, it just, or is it the volume? Mostly it tells you like the, the density of the material as it was coming out. So when it comes out, it tells you how was it easy for the heat from these lava to escape, or did they have to bounce around between particles? So that means if it's mostly crystalline, it means it was, it was really dense with a lot of different lava parks where, they, where the heat couldn't escape the, right. the gas cloud. And you don't mean density in terms of it, it, it's... It, right, right, You right. mean how many per unit volume? Right, of yeah. particles, yeah, okay. exactly. So if it's, if it's glassy, then it, the heat just easily escaped, yeah. didn't bounce off another particle, and just okay. kind of just left. So this is a remote way of telling something about what the eruption plume must have been like perhaps millions if not billions of years ago. Yeah, what a right. wonderful detective right. story. And it's, it's amazing that these things are still there. You yeah. know, after billions of years, we can just go back Terrific. and look. And I think you've also got, in the next slide, we've got one which uh, looks at a place where we have actually sent astronauts. Right. right. So here we've got three images. So again, tell us what we're looking so, at. So yeah, so it's kind of a background. It's, it's, it's important to test our model and make sure that our models actually work. So we want to test it to an Apollo site. So we test it to the Apollo 17, which actually landed on a volcanic uh, deposit. So what you're seeing on the left is that 750 image again, um, kind of showing the different geography of the area. So the sculpted hills, the shorty crater, which is the area where we sampled, uh, this landing site, and so on. Uh, what you're seeing in the middle is this thing called uh, shorty or the glass abundance map. And you can see that I'm really zooming in the Shorty Crater because that's where we sampled from. And what you're seeing is, if you look on the bottom left, it, the, the deposit was really, it's really red because it had a lot of glass. And that's exactly what we observed. And, and in these three the images, we're seeing exactly the same part of the lunar surface, correct? So these yep. images, you could overlay um, either the glass or the one on the right, which is a mineral, right. over the photograph and say, here we know astronauts back in 72 picked up a sample from Shorty Crater, and this is what they found. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the excellent part. So that's what we're really showing and emphasizing is, like even the olivine, which was found in the Apollo samples on the right, which is really bright in Shorty Crater, and what we've noticed is our model actually do match up with the uh, the actual sample that came back. So the data, the, the modeling that we've done for these different pyroclastic deposits, it appears to be, could be accurate because we have tested it to something that is of known. But, but to do all of this kind of research, you've got to have a variety of different skill sets, right? You, you, you sort of, you understand volcanic eruptions. You mm -hmm. understand how to process 
satellite data. Right. You understand how to combine topography. How did you get into this line of work? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, basically, when I was growing up, when I was back in third grade, I remember going through books. You know, we had to check out a book that, you know, that we wanted to read. And I wasn't really the person who read, you know, things like novels that had plots. I was the guy who was like, I want to learn something new. And I stumbled onto space, mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, books on like Venus. And to realize that we actually have maps of these, of these planets and high resolution images, that's where I really learned this is what I want to do. Because all my life, I've always liked to learn maps. Right? I like looking at maps. And by having these different wavelengths of light, it tells you something different. So I got more into it. And I went through college, you know, study as much as I can, physics mm. and geology. I try to be as eclectic so as possible. So you have a physics background. There presumably is some computer skills that you mm -hmm. have. Anybody who's watching, for example, who would also be interested in the moon, what, what should she be doing if she's trying to become like yourself and a lunar scientist? I think it's um, I think it's important to get a taste of as many different parts of natural uh, natural science as possible uh, because planetary science just encompasses an entire planet, right? Right. So you know you really want to cover your geology, your meteorology. Uh, your physics, your astronomy, and chemistry, and just you know, take a little bit of each and try to you know, and put them together and see the bigger and picture. And where do you go from here in your own research? Are you sort of, uh, uh, there's still much to learn about the moon. Is that the best place to study, or you've got a grant to work on Mercury? I understand. Yeah. So I mean, I'm 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 still continuing, um, and I'm I'm still learning. More about there's so much more to learn about the moon, and the moon is a great place to learn because it's the only place you know where we actually went to the ground, grabbed some samples, and brought them back. Um, so there's still so much more data to analyze. There's so much data to synthesize, which is also another important part. You know, we spend a lot of time looking at one data set, understanding it really well, but it's also important to also to bring all the other data sets and make a bigger story out of it. And why is a good place to do this kind of research? Oh, definitely. I mean, we have some of the best scientists, you know, in the world. You know, when I go to a Lunar Planetary Science Conference, you know, people are like, oh, you know, you go to the University of Hawaii. Wow, mm -hmm. you know, you guys have all these amazing people um, doing great science. So it's, it's a great, you know, honor to work with all these people who do the, such amazing work and to learn from them and to, you know, grow from there. And the personalities are great. You know, everybody's very, very friendly. I absolutely love working in Hawaii, and I well, definitely excellent. recommend it to anyone. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, David. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time of the show, but I want to thank you again. And let me just remind our viewers, you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guest today has been Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral research associate within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And so until next week, have a good week, and we'll see you next Monday. Goodbye.